good evening everyone welcome to riverside baptist church if you're watching online or you're here in person glad to have you with us are you glad you're saved Amen. good we're going to sing about it page 509 i've found a friend who is all to me saved 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 let's all stand together as we sing this great hymn from 509 i've found a Life now is sweet and my joy is complete For I'm saved, saved, saved He saves me from every sin and harm Secures my soul each day I'm leaning strong on His mighty arms. I know he'll guide me all the way. Saved by his power divine, saved to new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete for I'm saved, saved, saved. When poor and needy and all alone In love he said to me Come unto me and I'll lead you home To live with me eternally Life now is sweet and our joy is complete for I'm saved, saved. Wonderful, wonderful thought. Page 572, He the pearly gates will open. We'll sing all three verses of 572. Love divine so great and wondrous, deep and mighty, pure, sublime, coming from the heart of Jesus, just the same through test of time. He, the pearly gates, will open so that I may enter in. For he purchased my redemption and forgave me all my sin. Love divine so great and wondrous, all my sin the Lord forgave. I will sing his praise forever, for his blood his power to save. The pearly gates will open so that I may enter in. For he purchased my redemption and forgave me all my sin. In life's even time at twilight, at his door I'll knock and wait. By the precious blood of Jesus. Thus I shall enter heaven's gate. He, the pearly gates, will open so that I may enter in. For he purchased my redemption and forgave me all my sin. Good singing. You can be seated. 
And we'll turn over to page 478. It is well with my soul. Wonderful, wonderful thought, wonderful sentiment. We'll sing the first and the second and the last of page 478. When peace like a river. When peace like a river. When sorrows like sea. Guarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. The clouds be rolled back as a soul. The trump shall resound and the Thank you very kindly. Any announcements this evening, sir? Oh, it is well with our soul. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll have our offertory this evening. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much that thou makest all things well. Yea, Lord, when sorrow comes, you make it well. When sadness comes, we live most of our time in joy and gladness, but there are times when we have troubles and sorrow, and we're grateful for the fact that you came and you control and make it well with our souls. And you've given us church, too, where we can get together with people we love, brothers and sisters, bear one another's burdens. You make it well with us as well, so we're grateful today. Be pleased, dear Lord, with all that's done and said here this evening. Bless our hearts to the opening of your word. Apply it. Give us knowledge and wisdom. And may we be renewed because we came this evening. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear Oh, because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer <clears throat> Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful Who will all our sorrows share? <clears throat> Jesus knows our every weakness Take it to the Lord in prayer are we weak and heavy laden, comfort with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> in his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a soul lost there. Now, my friends, you'll open the Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. That's where I've been for many Sunday nights because there's so much in this passage that I want to share with you. So we're going again tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And without going over all the details that I've given you in the past, I nevertheless want to call your attention to those principles starting in verse 14 of separation. And most people don't like to hear about separation. I'm going to tell you what I told you several Sunday nights ago. The doctrine of separation, in fact, doctrine itself divides people. And we're so nervous today, we don't want to be divided at all. We want all branches, so to speak, all varieties of Christianity just coexist, just come together. On what foundation? Well, on the foundation of, of love and cooperation and an understanding and whatever. All right, how about the foundation of the very truths in the Word of God that cannot be compromised? You can't compromise them. But, but you, you just, you don't have to emphasize this and that and the other thing. I'll give you an example in a few minutes. Well, you may not have to, but you should because it's in the Scripture. Now, if God's Word says it, that makes it so. That makes it correct. That makes it what people of God ought to hear, thus saith the Lord, and here it is. But there are preachers and there are churches that will bypass a lot of things in the Scripture. Why? Why do you want to go there? Why don't you want to go there? Well, uh, people are divided over an issue, and uh, we want to, don't want to go into issues. We just want to come together and love everybody. I've even heard it said like this, I like the positive things in the Bible. Now I like positive things too. I like positive people. In fact, I don't like to be around negative people because negative people are, to use an old-fashioned expression, seemingly always down in the mouth. 
The only person I know that's always down in the mouth is my dentist. But nevertheless, there are people that, I, I guess it's just their personality. Uh, like, uh, how are you doing? Well, I, I use this once in a while just to get a response out of people. They'll say, how are you doing? I say, well, I was doing better, but I got over it. And then they look at me like, huh? I said, got your attention, didn't I? Now, I'm not that kind of a person. Now, I'm not one of these super positive persons either. Like, everything is just hip, hip, hooray in life. It's just everything's coming up, roses or daisies. No, that's for dead people. Isn't it? But anyway, everything's coming up just like it ought to come up in life. I'm not one of those either. I guess I'm somewhere in between. I want to be a realist when it comes to life and to the things of God's Word. So there are people who say, well, we just, in our church, we don't deal with this and we don't talk about that and the preacher never touches on the other because doctrine in particular, I've already told you, does divide. Come to think of it, I remember the Lord Jesus saying, think not that I am come to bring peace on earth. I am not come to bring peace, but what? A sword. What does a sword do? Well, it divides and it can destroy. <laughs> So you don't want to mess with them. So there are five principles in verses 14, 15, and 16 in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Five principles on which you and I and the Corinthians were to consider separation. Now I've given you all of those time and time again. I have no more time for that tonight except for number five, which is in the first part of verse 16. So 14 and 15 are four and the, the foundation is the first expression in verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together. And then there are five principles that you need to utilize in your life so that you do not become yoked together with unbelievers. Now, unbelievers comes in two categories. There are people who are unbelievers like I once was 65 years ago. I was not a saved person. Oh, yes, I was a Christian. <laughs> quote unquote. I was a Christian in name only. I was a Christian because I've been baptized. I was a member of a denominational church. They claim to be Christian, and I guess it is. And a lot of people in there are saved, and a lot of them aren't, just like Baptist churches. But yet, I did not know the Lord as my Savior. So I was, even though I never looked at myself that way, an unbeliever, a non believer. I believed in God. I believed in Jesus. I learned about him in Sunday school every Sunday. I mean, how can you be otherwise? Well, if you're not born again, you are otherwise. So, this is the principle. Now, here, here come the five that I can't go over. I told you a couple of minutes ago. But I will take us to number five. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? I think first in that passage... The Apostle Paul is talking about the local church. The local church is the place where God has placed his name. Now in the Old Testament, God said he would place his name in the tabernacle. He would place his name in the temple that would take the place of the tabernacle. And then the temple is destroyed. At least the second temple is destroyed in 70 AD. It's all gone. And uh, God, in, in essence, even before that time, had begun, as Jesus said in his message in Matthew chapter 16, build his church. And building a church simply means that it's ongoing. It's never truly built. Only a building can be built. But this is just a building where the church, and I'm looking at part of the church tonight, it would be great if I could look at all the church, but it's a Baptist church. Which means it ain't gonna happen. In other words, you're not going to get all the members of the Baptist Church together at one time. Uh, I'm going to suppose, I'm probably right in this, that's why I'm supposing it, that even if you had my funeral, you still wouldn't get all the members of the Baptist Church together, even at the preacher's funeral. That's just the way Baptists are. Therefore, when we come to where God has placed His name, you're talking about a local assembly of baptized believers that are organized to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ, and that is to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature here and wherever God will open a door. Now that's why we're here. And then according to Matthew 28, teaching them after you've won them to Christ 
to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And that means edification. Edification is a big word, simply means to build up. So we build up one another in the faith. We encourage one another in the faith. So this is what we're looking at in the first part of verse 16. However, you and I need to have separation principles firmly secured in our life. That's the first four in particular. But as I've said now for the third time tonight, I'm not going there. I want to deal where I began last Sunday night with what agreement hath the temple of God, that is the local assembly. This is where God has promised to meet with us. Yes, he's in our hearts at all times through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that he sends into our lives when we trust his son as savior. Nevertheless, we come together as a church to present ourselves before our Lord, to fellowship with one another, and be blessed by the word of God and by each other's presence. So what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Now the obvious answer to question number five is the same answer to questions one, two, three, four in verses 14 and 15, and it's none. None, there, there's no answer. It's an obvious answer. There is no agreement. Now from that point, I began something in three parts. This is part number two. In just a second, well, not a second, in a moment. You know what a moment is? What's a moment? A moment's an extended period of time. A minute is 60 seconds. I caught you, didn't I? Okay. In a moment of time, not a minute, because then you'll say, 60 seconds. He can't do anything in 60 seconds when it comes to the pulpit. But nevertheless, let me help us to understand how this applies, taking section by section of a three-part message that I gave many years ago to a group of Baptist preachers and upcoming Baptist preachers on the subject of contemporize or fossilize. Now the reason I'm there, and I was there last Sunday night, I'm going to be there tonight, and I'm going to be there next Sunday night, is because this is a message not only did I preach to preachers, but I have finally seen an opportunity to share this message with you because what you see in the first part of verse 16 is an ecclesiastical, which is a big word for church separation principle. Not only do individuals need to be separated from the world, I'm not talking about segregated from the world. By the way, if you're going to be segregated from the world, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul said, then must ye needs go out of the world. So everywhere you move in life, you have people around you. And we need to be committed to those people. We need to be committed to live a separated life so that they will have a desire, at least, to hear what we have to say when we talk with them about what Jesus Christ has done for us. If they see nothing in our lives that has changed from before we were saved, then they're not interested. If they see no difference in our lives now that we claim to be saved, then they're not interested. So make sure that you are living a separated life and sometimes their standards might be a little bit stronger or higher than ours. And if they are, all I can say is shame on us. If they think Christians shouldn't drink, and nowadays it's popular for Christians to booze, then shame on us. If they think Christians uh, should not use the same language they use, and we do use the same language, and we do take the Lord's name in vain, by the way, taking the Lord's name in vain is to use his holy name in a frivolous, irreverent manner. That's what it means. And it can go a lot stronger than that. Then we need to change our vocabulary. I recently talked to a fellow. Uh, I'd known him for a few years, hadn't seen him for quite a while. He was uh, in politics. And uh, when I met this fellow, again, uh, we reintroduced re ourselves and so forth. Then I had a chance to witness to him and several other people. And after I witnessed to them, I went one by one, family members, and I said, are you a saved person? Have you been born again? And he got a response out of three family members. Then when I came to him, I said, are you a saved person? 
Are you born again? Do you understand what I'm talking about? And there was a, just a second hesitation. Now you and I would hesitate, would we? We would not hesitate. Hello! We would not hesitate to declare that we are saved, born again people. But he has, uh, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. I said, you know for sure, your sins have been forgiven and there's a place in heaven for you. A uh, yes. It was that slight hesitation. Now maybe I'm off, maybe he's off on his profession. But nevertheless, I had to ask him. Therefore, you and I need to know that we're saved, why we're saved, and therefore, we can have a good witness to other people if we live a separated life. Now, I had also on other occasions heard bad language come out of his mouth. But with some Christians nowadays, it doesn't matter. For example, I gave you a principle last Sunday night, and the principle was all moral, all things are moral if they're not illegal. That's the way a lot of Christians are looking at the Christian life. Everything is okay unless it's illegal. Is it okay for a Christian to buy a six pack? Sure. Can I buy a six pack? I wouldn't even have to give ID to buy one, I would think, but I've never tried it. I'm just going to make the assumption. And you would agree, however, no preacher, it is not morally right for you to go into a convenience store and buy a six pack. Everybody agree with that? Raise your hand. And for the rest of you, I'm raising one for you. All right, so you, we're all in agreement on that. Yes, no preacher should do that. How about you? Should you do that? Well, it's not illegal. I don't care. Uh, Florida's passed a new gambling law. I'm not sure I understand it. I read a very lengthy article in the paper that last week about it, and I still don't think I understand it. But nevertheless, if it brings in money, that's all that counts, doesn't it? In other words, does it work? Does gambling work for state and local coffers? Yeah, it works. But should gambling be legalized? Well, if you say yes, people say, no, 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 that's, that's not true. You shouldn't do that. You, you can't say something like that. I'm even for temperance. What was it that uh, our country voted on? Was it 1918 or 1919? What, what was that called? Prohibition. Prohibition, yeah. You are for prohibition? Prohibition never worked. I see. In other words, your principles are based upon the end justifies the means. Huh? Yeah. Would you stand if there were a prohibition movement today and promote prohibition? Yes, I would. Well, it's, it's, not, it's never going to happen. It's just never, it happened and it was done with. By the way, I think a lot of lives were saved in prohibition. A lot of lives were taken because gangsterism really got a big start in America. It's always been around, but it was big time doing prohibition. Because anytime you tell people that something is outlawed or you cannot have it, they are going to have it. They're going to find a way to have it. I'm not justifying it, I'm just telling you what the truth is. But prohibition, prohibition I think saved a lot of lives. I think it saved a lot of marriages and a lot of homes. But now you're never going to hear about that. Why? Well, because the booze crowd don't want you to hear that. But since I'm not a part of the booze crowd, I can tell you about it. But I don't have any more time, just using examples. So now, we're looking at separation principles, not only for the individual, but separation principles for the church. This is part number two, an investigation of church methodology. Or as they would say it today that I told you last Sunday night, I don't like the phrase, I don't use the phrase, but everybody seems to understand the phrase, so I'll use it. This is how you do church. I think that's so irreverent to talk like that. Well, this is how we do church. I mean, to me, that, that, that takes everything sacred and kind of brings it down a notch or two. And uh, I, I just don't want to go there. All right, the investigation of church methodology. Number one, shall we continue with the traditional? I sometimes tell people, uh, this is a traditional church. 
or as Pastor Stephen put out, I didn't realize he'd put it out. I just happened to mention it one time when I was talking to him here about several weeks ago. And lo and behold, then he puts that on the sign out front. So if you like what's on the sign out front, you give him the acclamation for it. You say, thank you, it looks good. If you don't like it, come see me. And, I, and then I'll talk you out of it if I can. But anyway, because I, I like what he puts out there. Nevertheless, he put out there, this is your grandmother's church. Remember that? You ought to. You put it out. All right. This is your grandmother's church. This is traditional church. What is traditional? All right. Let me give you a dictionary definition. That which has been handed down as a way of thinking and acting. I'll augment that in a minute. A pattern of beliefs or practices. Another semicolon there. And finally from the dictionary, customary methods. Now, we'll ask a couple of questions. <clears throat> will the traditional form of service, the form that we have in our church, will it please God? Well, if it doesn't, let's not show up. We don't need to be here. If we're here thinking, I don't like this expression either. I'm going to use it again in the message. I don't like this expression. When we, make, we get together, we expect God to show up. I don't like that. Again, it's like the other one. It's just, it's, it's taking everything sacred and bringing it down a notch or two or three on kind of a street level. Let me tell you something. When church gathers, God does not show up. We show up for him. He does not show up for us. As though, well, we're here. Now we're going to bring out the drums and the cymbals and the electrified guitars and we're going to beat and beat and beat like... Uh, <clears throat> Can I say a jungle? I won't identify a jungle whether it's in one part of the world or another part of the world because people get upset and again, they call me a racist. Well, go ahead. But we're not going to bring the jungle beat in. That's, by the way, what distinguishes real music from rock music. It is the beat. And I'll get to that in a few minutes. Just hang in there. So uh, it's 6.34, and we've got a long way to go, and try to be out by 7 o'clock. No promises. We'll just see what we can do. Will it please God? If it doesn't, I've already said, then let's not, let's not meet anymore. To open God's Word and to focus upon God's Word and focus upon His presence and He meets with us in the pages of His Word. To, to focus upon that which draws us close to the Lord. Isn't that what we're doing? Isn't that why we open the book? Isn't that why I find a phrase in the Bible, a nice sounding phrase, and I close my Bible, and then I walk to this side, and I walk to that side, and, and I'm not talking about preachers that walk around, that's not the point. But I nevertheless walk to this side, and I walk to that side, and I'm telling everybody how wonderful you are. And I think you're wonderful friends, and you're wonderful family members for me. But I'm not trying to build up your self-esteem. I'm not trying to give you more self-worth. I'm not trying to say, reach out and be entrepreneurial in your spirit. You can accomplish this and you can do that. And, and I go over here and I give you the Pepsi Dent smile. And I go over here and I give you the Crest smile. I don't have one. I have a smile, but Mary Lou says I ought to smile more often in the pulpit anyway. It's okay. Did that help? All right. Listen. Will what we are doing please God? Not will it work, but I'm telling you, it will work. We focus on his presence. We focus on his word. We focus on his commission. Do you know what we have done as traditional churches? We have started churches. We have planted churches in America. We have planted churches around the world. We have built churches. We have supported missions all over the world and still continue to do these things. We have produced revivals in, in ages gone by. 
We have seen lives changed and people given hope because we offer unto them repentance and faith in Jesus Christ who comes into your life and changes your life. That's what we preach, the old-fashioned gospel. That's what's worked. Well, it ain't working like it ought to work. If it ain't working like it ought to work, it's because we're not working it. Well, we, we ought to see a revival in our church. Well, then get revived. I'm waiting on the Spirit of God. No, the Spirit of God's already in your life. Just yield to the Spirit of God, and you'll find that revival will come into your life if you'll do what God tells you to do. But if you think I can bring in a high-powered, well-known, name-brand preacher, and he'll get everybody all excited, that may happen. It may happen, but it won't last. Because then, then we get settled back into our comfort zones, and we don't want to be disturbed. We, we just want to be kind of left alone. It, it's, like, it's like the old ditty. This, this is ridiculous. It's like the old ditty that says, thank God it's us four and no more. So we don't have to need any more. We got the bills paid. Uh, we're accomplishing uh, what we set out to do for our missionaries. Well, why don't we do that at home? So will the traditional form of worship work? Will it please God? All right. If our philosophy of ministry is right, and I've talked to you just briefly now about building churches and supporting missions and producing revival and changing lives and giving hope to people, if, if that comes from the gospel, if that comes from repentance and faith and a trusting of Jesus Christ and a turning your life over to Him and now devoting your life to live for Him, why do we want to change? Why don't we... Why don't we intensify what we're doing? Hello? Amen. Amen. Intensify what you're doing. You say, well, I'd love to see the church feel. Well, make it happen. Intensify your reaching out to people. And that's what will happen. Now, I'm going to take us to another question. Question number one was, Shall we continue with the traditional? Question number two, shall we compromise with the contemporary? Now here's, here's where you get into deep water. You ready? What is contemporary? I'll go to the dictionary. Marked by that which is in the present period. That is time of life. Semicolon. Current trends. That's the contemporary. 1988-1989. I can't remember. My wife is not able to be here tonight because of her knee problems. Uh, she's watching this. So if she could help me, and she probably will as soon as I get home, she'll say, no, no, you're, you're off a year. That's okay. I just know what happened. Unbeknownst be known to her what would happen at a ladies' fellowship in another part of the state. She took a couple of three van loads or car loads of, of our younger ladies in particular to a ladies' fellowship, an overnight thing. They had an advance, hotel reservations, meals provided by the church, that kind of thing. And Mary Lou did not realize the kind of music that had now been brought into the church. I did not know that because the pastor was a close friend of mine. But I hadn't seen him in a while. So they go to this church and they check in by four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Everything's settled. They go to the first service that night and they bring out what is now called a praise and worship band. Now, you, you can't have a band without drums and electrified guitars, bass guitars, and so forth. And that was the music. Mary Lou called me that evening after the service. She said, I've gotten myself into a mess up here, or out there, wherever it was. And so she explained it to me. 
And she said, I, I would just love tomorrow morning tell our ladies we're going home. Now that was a Friday afternoon. Tomorrow morning we're going home. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't want to sit through this, this entertainment again. The pulpit is no longer a pulpit. The pulpit is a stage. Now to me a stage is um, four wheels pulled by four to six horses. That's a stage to me. I'm just teasing you. But a stage is that which serves as a platform for plays and shows and entertainment and whatever. You call it a stage. Do me a favor. Don't ever call this a stage. And if I ever slip up and do, will you rebuke me and say, Pastor, you said never to use that. A uh, platform, I, I, I can handle that. Pulpit, well, now we're going back to something from Scripture. A pulp, this is called a pulpit area. It's, by the way, not a play area for kids. But kids love steps, and so there you go. And she said, tomorrow morning, I don't even want to go to breakfast over at the church. I just want to pack our ladies up and instead of leaving at 3 o'clock in the afternoon because they had a half a Saturday day program already lined up, she said, I, ju I just can't take this music. Okay, she stayed. I said, wait it out. Let's just see what happens. And the next morning and early afternoon, it was all the same thing, uh, big, big programs on the stage. And, and uh, to me, to me, it's, it's rock music. It's rock music under the banner of Christ. Now that, that's my opinion. So, well, I don't agree with that opinion because music is amoral. A meaning no morals. That's not true. And if I had time, I'd really go into that. Music is not amoral. Music is very moral. And if you don't believe that, then just try. I don't know if you can do it. I can't do it. Try to decipher rap music. Try to get the words. Even rock music. Try to get to the words in the rock music because the beat is so overpowering and the screaming and carrying on, I, I just, I can't handle it. I sit there and I'm trying to figure, what are they saying? Mary Lou says, what are they singing? What are the words? I don't know what the words are. It's just a lot of screaming to me. Now, I also realize that you might like rock music. Well, so did I. Until I came to the point where I could no longer handle trying to live for Christ and being a fan, a devotee of rock music at the same time. And I had to make a decision of separation because I've given you in the past the example of my neighbor that I tried to win to Christ and she would not listen to the gospel. And she told me very plainly, do you listen to rock music? Yes. She said, then rock music, so the devil. And she would not listen to me giving her the gospel. And so I was so devastated. I, I had to make a decision. Do I continue with rock music as a part of my life? I had the same problem with Hollywood movies. And I'm thankful to the Lord. I'm thankful to the Lord because I give credit to him. He, uh, he helped me to extricate myself from those two. Should I use the word? Yeah, I should. From those two evils. You say, wow. Well, oh, by the way, it sure is quiet in here tonight. Uh-huh. I can imagine. All right. The contemporary is based on the philosophy of pragmatism. What is pragmatism? If it works, it's good. Use it. Whatever it takes. Back to my story. On the way home, in three vehicles. That's all the ladies, especially the younger marrieds. By the way, our church then would have about 225, 250 people every Sunday. Uh, the seats were filled in here every Sunday morning and half filled on Sunday night. And the, the younger ladies in particular, we had a large young marriage class. We had probably 15 couples over there, at least. I'm talking about young marriage. And all Mary Lou said we could hear on the way home was, Wow, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's, a, quote, our kind of music, end of quote. They kept saying, that's our kind of music. We can do that in church. That's our kind of music. They're doing it there. And they have a bigger building. And they have more people. They're more successful. 
I know what will get a crowd. I've told you that. Let me step aside and you bring in a pastor who will lead you to turn the church to a contemporary venue. And people will come. I, I almost guarantee it. You, you'll get twice the people you have now. Now it's going to cost a little more money because you're going to have to pay to have musicians from outside your church come in for a rock band. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think about it. Yes, you should think about that because I know, I know what, I talk to pastors, I talk to preachers, I know what I'm talking about. If you can't raise them up in your own congregation, then what you use to get people, you will have to use to keep people. And once you get them into entertainment, you're going to have to entertain them Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And now you realize that often they won't even bother with the Sunday night service. Why? Well, it's too expensive. We've got to pay for the praise and worship band to come back on Sunday night. And we've got to go through another, another different program than we had on Sunday morning. And boy, it, it's just hard keeping up with, with everybody else, isn't it? And that's what it's going to take. Pragmatism. Practicality, stressing consequences. Listen, consequences to determine why you do something. No, no. With the Word of God, you do it because God commands it, or you don't do it because He says don't do it. You do what God commands, and you do not be concerned about the consequences. If God says it's right, it's right. Well, it's not going to do what we need done. It doesn't matter. Thus saith the Lord. Does truth matter? Does value matter? Does that work? Yes, that works. But it won't get the crowds. Well, if you don't have the crowds, then uh, you don't have what I told you last Sunday night. You don't have the money. So whatever it takes, that's philosophy. The end justifies the means. Will it compromise our music? I'm going to give you some quotes. From a dear friend of mine, college mate, uh, we had Greek classes and other classes, Bible classes together in college, graduated at the same time. He still lives in Pensacola. His name is Gerald Manley, Dr. Gerald Manley. Gerald has been able to write so clearly and down on a level where everybody understands for so many years. I've always admired his writings. I call him once in a while to tell him that. And I say, Gerald, I know that you're in retirement and you're up at my age now and you don't have the health that I have. I, I just wish you would continue to write because he could just be spot on, as they say. Okay, from uh, Gerald's book. I'll give you the name of it if I can find it here. I wrote it down uh, somewhere. Oh, let me see. Here, yeah, Strange Noises in the Night. Joe wrote a, a book, Strange Noises in the Night. Here he here, here goes. I'm quoting Gerald now. CCM, that's Christian Contemporary Music, has an appeal only because of the presence of an addiction to rock music. Wow. It is a compromise seeking to reach the next generation. Spot on. Permeated by all of fundamentalism. And that's just about right. I have his book, Dan Lucarini. If you've never read his book, I'd like you to read it. I know it's several years old, but the truths are still there. Dan Lucarini was in the rock music industry. I mean, all fours in. And he came out of it. And then he went into the contemporary Christian music ministry and was one of the leaders in putting together the contemporary Christian music venue many years ago. Dan Lucarini. I have a couple of his books in my library. Quote, when the drum set finally appeared on the platform, I believe it reached the steepest and most dangerous part of the slope. Uh, sip, slippery slope, you know what I'm talking about? More than any other instrument, a drum set is the key instrument of contemporary music styles. Drums are used to drive the beat. Rock's true differentiation from other music. Luke Carini further says, Contemporary always prevails over traditional because it feeds the sinful desire 
of our flesh. And those ladies came back and said, that's our kind of music. And then I got, I got blasted all of a sudden. I, I had them coming in, three and four and five of the group coming in to talk to me. We got to talk to the pastor about this. This is the music we need in our church. This is what we want in our church. And they came into my office and they all sat down and, and I sat and listened as I will. And they said, we've got to have this. Do you realize our church could double within a year's time with this kind of music? This is our kind of music. This is what we want in our church. And when they finished, and I had two or three groups come in within a week's time. They're determined. This is what we're going to have in our church. And I didn't get as vociferous as I am now. I was very calm. I said, I can't do that. You're asking me to bring the culture of the world into the church. The rock, America and the world lives on rock music. If you don't believe it, uh, go around people who are working. You know what they're listening to? They're not listening to Beethoven. They're not listening to Tchaikovsky. They're not listening to hymns. It's the rock beat, it's the rock beat, the rock beat. I've had people in church say, you, you don't listen to music when you work? I'm working right here. I said, no, I don't listen to music when I work. I can't concentrate on what I'm doing in the work and listen to rock music at the same time. You say, well, I, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that. All right, well, then you go ahead and do it, but I'm not going to do it. So they said, all of them got together. They had a private meeting in a home. And they all got together and said, if the pastor will not give us what we want, then we will just have to go elsewhere. And they did. And attendance-wise, our church has never recovered, attendance-wise. We've never been able to fill the building like we once did 30-some-odd years ago. Remember I told you about three weeks ago, I'd tell you what happened back in uh, late 88 and 89. There were some other issues that came up as well, but that was a biggie. And then all of a sudden, young marriage with the kiddies, they're gone. Within a month's time, they're all drifted off. They're gone. You say, well, you, you should have kept the church together. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God kept the church together without me compromising. And I would not compromise. And I'm not going to. So don't ever come to me and ask me. I'm not going to do it. Number two. Will it compromise our message? The contemporary. Will it compromise our message? By all contemporary standards, what I do tonight, what I do on Sunday morning, is outmoded. People are not interested in preaching anymore. I learned almost 50 years ago that uh, if you stay strictly with the Bible, the day's going to come when it's going to be downgraded, put aside, outmoded, not wanted, not desired, because you must, you must appeal to people's what they call felt needs. They feel certain needs in their lives. And if you want to get a crowd, that's what you have to do. All offensive things in a service must be removed. The sinner is designated, you heard, as a seeker and must made to feel comfortable in church or the sinner will not come back to your church. Is that true? Well, that's probably true. If you want them to come back, you'll have to make them feel comfortable. Go ye therefore and make all people feel comfortable, Jesus. No, I'm sorry. I got that wrong. Uh, I'm teasing you. I'm joking with you. That's not our responsibility to make people feel comfortable. Reach them by activities and entertainments, felt needs, no inflammatory rhetoric and provocative terminology. They are counterproductive. Twice in the book of Luke, Jesus said in the same passage, except you repent, What'd you say, Bill? You shall all likewise perish? That's exactly what he said. That's not popular. Do you realize that the preaching and teaching of the Son of God eventually put him on the cross? 
It drove him to, to the cross. That was the Father doing that, I understand. But that's what the world saw. We're not put up with this. And they put him on the cross. That's inflammatory. You, you, can't, you can't stand it. We had a lady one time. I led her and a husband to the Lord. Uh, he was a dentist. This is going back a long time ago. Uh, I led them to the Lord, led their only son to the Lord. They were members of our church for about a year and a half. And finally, the lady came to me after a Sunday morning service. She said, Pastor, uh, we're, we're going to have to leave. I said, you moving your practice? No, no, we're going to have to leave church. Oh, now, I like surprises. I don't like shocks. Now I'm shocked. I led these people to Christ. And she said, uh, I have brought some of my friends to the service. And she had some of her social club type friends. And that's, that's fine. She brought them to church. And she said to me, I'm almost quoting her. She said, you cannot stand up there and tell them that they're sinners and going to hell. These are good people. You cannot tell them that, Pastor. And she said, frankly, I'm embarrassed when I bring my friends and you preach like that. She said, we're going to have to go to another church. And they did. And for about two to three months, I got a phone call once a week from her. I got a phone call once a week. It was quite interesting. I'd look forward to it every week. It was always on Monday. She would call me and say, now, Pastor Dean, the, the pastor at the new church where we're going, uh, he said this and he said that. Uh, what does the Bible say? I love those phone calls. And uh, I called out her name. I'm not going to give you her name. And I said, okay, uh, here's what the scripture says. Every week, went on for two or three months. Every Monday, call me. Well, the, now the preacher yesterday said, uh, what, is, what does the Bible really say about that? Got to gauge the preacher. Well, preaching is outmoded. We're to the point where we want people to feel very comfortable so they'll come back. The seeker becomes the focus of the message and everything is geared toward making this person feel wanted and welcome. Make people feel wanted and welcome. Do it right. right. Don't walk around them in the aisle and take a quick look at them and keep on going. Don't do that. You ignore people when you do that. You say, oh, now you're really, really tearing into us, aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you it's what we ought to do because I see people do that. You see somebody sitting, you don't know the name. Don't nudge somebody sitting beside you and say, who's that? I don't know that, but I don't know who that is. And just look at them. Don't do that. Make people think that they're special guests because they are. Encourage them to come back to church. Introduce yourself. Don't have to ask somebody on Wednesday night, uh, who is that that was seated in the back row or the front row, wherever it was on Sunday morning? Uh, I, I just, I never got around to meeting him. No, no, you were too hurried to get out of the building and to go do what you wanted to do so you don't meet visitors. Meet visitors. If I were a visitor to your church and you did not give me any recognition, I don't want my name called out. That's not the point. I don't want to have to stand up and so forth. I'm not interested in that. But just, just let me know that you care that I visited your church. I may come back to your church. But if you'd ignore me, I would not, I'm, I'm not coming back. I don't care how good the preacher may be. I, I'm, I'm not going back. I want friendship. I want people to care for me, and I want to care for people. Let me get back to my message. Number three, will it affect or compromise our militancy? Try and think about how I want to say this. Will we take Baptist off of our church sign? Now, a lot of churches have done that. I have, I have friends in the ministry, and they have done that. I don't fuss with them. I don't bring it up to them. I don't ask them why. I know why. I don't ask them why. And they're my friends. And they're going to be my friends. And I preached in some of those churches where it was no longer identified as a Baptist church. It was just uh, whatever, you know, Sunset Church or Sunrise Church instead of Sunrise Baptist or Sunset Baptist, whatever. 
and I don't, I don't fuss with them, but I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to say, we identify to all people. Well, if you're going to do that, then what, do you, what, do you, what are your doctrines? What are your principles in which you stand? By the way, you need to know why you're a Baptist. And 98% 90, of Baptists don't know why. They, they just don't know why. Well, I, I like the church. I joined the church. Got the Baptist name on it. So that makes me a Baptist. Or I was baptized in a Baptist church or under the authority of a Baptist church. And that makes me a Baptist. I can't go into this. But nevertheless, you need to know why. Is it convenience? Yeah, it's only a quarter mile away from where I live. Uh, I like the people there. Whenever they put on a feed, it's great. But you need to know why you're a Baptist. And I can't deal with that, I've told you. Will we, will we reject being a fundamentalist? I wish I had time to work with this, and I don't have, but maybe two or three minutes. I'm a fundamentalist. I don't say that with pride in myself. I say it with pride in what it means that I believe in the literal, normal interpretation of all the affirmations and attitudes of the Bible, every one of them. I believe every word of God is from the Holy Spirit of God. I believe that the book I hold before me has been preserved by God and will be preserved until the end of time. I believe that fundamental means basic, primary, and necessary for allegiance to Jesus Christ. Whatever the Bible says is true, period. That's where I stand. And if that makes me a fundamentalist, then I am a fundamentalist. I don't try to hide it. I am a fundamental preacher. The Bible is the Word of God. I stand upon the Bible as fundamental to all the doctrines and all that the Bible says. It's right here in the book. One more time for Gerald Manley. I'm finished with this, except for a chorus. Jerry wrote in his book, <clears throat> the old folks are either outnumbered, too tired to fight, or have no idea where to go when the change comes. And the change comes, we're gonna have a blended service. Lots of luck. Uh, blended is just the next step to full-fledged. The old folks are either outnumbered, too tired to fight, or have no idea where to go. Having devoted years of labor and tithes to establish a biblical witness, they sit stunned as the leadership that they have called to love them openly ignores their concerns and publicly lets them know that their days are numbered and they can get with the program or find another pew in another church. The CCM, Contemporary Christian Music, will have its contemporary Christian music regardless of the strewn bodies of trampled saints. I have heard preachers say, if you don't like what's happening, you need to leave. And you know what? Some people are leaving. Hmm. All right, Gerald just hit it right on the spot. Now here's my conclusion, the chorus anyway. I don't know if you've heard it, maybe you have. I don't know if there's any music for it. And I haven't embarrassed Joanne by pushing it on her this evening and saying, can you play this? Can you find this for me real quick? I'll be true, precious Jesus. I'll be true, I'll be true, precious Jesus, I'll be true. There's a race to be run, there's a victory to be won. Every hour, by thy power, I'll be true. Now we stand for prayer. It's about. I'm not going to give an invitation tonight. I'm going to have a closing prayer in a minute or two. But in this attitude of prayer, 
Thank you for coming. And if needs be that you have put up with me, thank you for putting up with me. Thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. A pastor feeds the sheep. A pastor leads the sheep. A pastor guards the sheep. In other words, he protects them as best he can. That's my responsibility. And I take it to the throne of grace almost daily, asking the Lord to help me not only preach the word, but to exemplify it and to be a pastor. Father in heaven, thank you for these friends. They support me and my family, Pastor Stevens and his family. They know that, I know that. And I believe that they'll stand beside us when we need it. Lord, I believe that you've called this church into existence almost 55 years ago. You planted it. I was an unworthy servant and still really am. So this church is thine. The property is thine. The buildings are thine. We are thine. Help us to be true to thee and never compromise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good night.